Welcome back, everyone. So today I'm going to tell you about a really cool algorithm called sparse representation for classification, or SRC. And this is uh, work that came out of this seminal 2009 paper, Robust Face Recognition via Sparse Representation, by Wright, Yang, Ganesh, Sastry, and Ma. And in some ways, this may be thought of as kind of a predecessor of the robust principal components analysis, which came a little bit later. Uh, and so I'm going to walk you through this really, really cool algorithm. and. What I think is really neat about this, the examples they chose were very compelling. So they use this for uh, human face recognition, so for classification of human faces, even with uh, really, really big occlusions and kind of missing data. So in this case, uh, there are two examples kind of in their, their, their main figure. The first one is a picture of a person wearing uh, big dark sunglasses, so blocking most of her face. But through this sparse representation for classification algorithm, this uh, algorithm is able to identify that this was, in fact, uh, this person. So it identified her. And it also could identify uh, kind of what her face would look like without the glasses and subtract those off. So it can figure out kind of uh, who that person is and where the biggest deviation kind of from the original image is, with, which is these big glasses. So that's pretty amazing to be able to subtract off someone's sunglasses. It's almost like x-ray vision, uh, and that's a pretty cool, cool algorithm. Here you have a similar image, uh, actually the same person with tons and tons of kind of, of noise on this image, and again through this procedure, somehow for a computer, for this algorithm, there still is enough information in this image to cross-reference it against the library and identify this person. So I'm going to walk you through this algorithm today and kind of show you how it works. Um, Again, I'll point out that you can find uh, more about this in chapter three of our textbook uh, by myself and Nathan Kutz, Data Driven Science and Engineering. You can download the whole PDF here. Uh, all of the code in MATLAB and in Python is available at databookuw.com and on GitHub. Uh, so please download this code, try it yourself. Um, this is super interesting. And again, uh, if you find this useful, like and subscribe, hit the bell uh, and write comments about what you like or don't like or what you want to see more of. Okay, so back to how this algorithm actually works. I'm gonna walk you through kind of the high level uh, of what SRC does and how it works. Uh, and this is from our, our text, Th this example is from our textbook. So the basic idea uh, is going to be kind of leveraging uh, robust statistics and the fact that patterns exist in your data. So you have this library of human face images and we're gonna use that uh, along with sparsity to cross-reference um, to cross-reference these images. So what we're going to do is we're going to take an image of a person, and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to downsample it so that it's a really really coarse version of that image. I mean, look, you can barely tell that this is that person at all. Okay, but that's the downsampled image, and then we're going to take that downsampled image and we're going to stack that as a tall, skinny vector with I don't know in this case maybe there are uh, a couple of hundred elements of this vector, maybe a hundred elements of this vector, okay? Uh, and we're going to do that, this is the important part, we're gonna do that for every single image of every single person in a large database. So you can imagine kind of this might be the Facebook database or you know some FBI database or whatever, but a big library of human images cropped and aligned so that you can do a singular value decomposition or principal component analysis. And what we're gonna do, so this is the Yale B faces data set where you have 36 people. For each of those people you have 64 images from different lighting conditions. And you can see up here, this is kind of that library downsampled and reshaped as column vectors. So this seventh person here is this whole kind of band of columns, right? This is 64 columns all for that one person. And every single person gets their own 64 columns in this massive, massive, massive uh, library, okay? And now this is, uh, you might be wondering, why did we downsample the image? That seems silly. There's so much more information here than there is here. Now the trick, here is that we're able to use sparse regression and kind of ideas from compressed sensing and sparse representation when this vector is much smaller than the number of columns in our library, 
So what we're, we have to downsample our high-res image so that it has uh, less rows than the number of columns in our library. And when we do that, this becomes a really, really um, kind of interesting underdetermined optimization problem or underdetermined regression problem. And we've seen this a lot in compressed sensing. This is a lot like the compressed sensing problem. What we're going to try to do is find some very sparse linear combination of the columns in our, in our library that add up to equal this column vector right here, Okay, this, this kind of test measurement that we have. And again, for that compressed sensing trick to work, we need uh, the number of measurements to be less than the number of columns in this, this uh, this matrix. Now, this is technically not compressed sensing. This really is a different animal altogether called sparse representation, but it's very similar to what we've been talking about in sparse optimization. Okay, So what we're going to do here is we're going to solve this sparse optimization problem. We're going to find uh, the minimum, the fewest columns in this library of faces that add up to equal this column. So we want to find the, the, so here you can see my coefficient vector. This is the coefficients that I multiply by all of these columns to add up to equal this one. And the goal here is for this coefficient vector to be as sparse as possible. And in fact, you can see that there are only uh, a couple of non-zero entries here, right here. And those correspond to entries in this part of the library right here, co corresponding to person seven, the seventh entry in the library. Okay, so, so that's really kind of the, the whole game here, is you, you take your image and a whole library of images, you downsample them so that the, the kind of number of entries in a column vector are less than the number of columns in the library, and then you do this sparse representation uh, optimization so you can represent this column sparsely in this library. Okay, so these are often called atoms in a basis, and you're trying to find a sparse representation of the new image in this library. Okay, and then uh, when you get the sparse vector of coefficients, now what you do, so this is literally the vector of coefficients here. Okay, and you can see that only a very few of these are non zero, and they happen to be in the library corresponding to one of our people. And so then, this is the really interesting part. So the, all I've told you right now is just sparse representation. The classification step comes at the end. So now I have this sparse vector of coefficients. I've done the sparse representation. Now what we do is we go person by person along this library, and we only use those coefficients for the first person, so these coefficients here, and we see how good if I only use those coefficients and this part of the library, how much error would I have in approximating this vector? That's uh, this bar here in my bar chart. Okay, And my error is really, really large. It's like order one error. That's terrible. Then I do that for person two in the person two library. So I go over here to my second column and my second set of coefficients. I see how well that does at approximating. I also get a lot of error for person two. Same with person three, person four, person five, and so on, until I get to person seven. And that is this guy is actually from, he is person seven. So by the time I get to person seven, now I am in a part of my sparse vector that actually has non-zero entries. And so when I multiply these coefficients for person seven by that part of the library, I actually get a pretty good approximation of this column vector, and I get relatively low error here. Okay, I get relatively low error uh, compared with all of the other representations for all of the other people. Okay, so this does require that in your library you have examples from many classes, for many categories that you have labels for. You know who's person one and person two and person three. And then what you go and do is you go, uh, once you have this sparse coefficient vector, you go person by person and you see how good would that, uh, those coefficients do with person one estimating this image, with person two estimating this image. And this is actually extremely effective. This is a very, very clear indicator that this image came from person seven. Okay, so this is how you classify images uh, using SRC. And it's all based on this idea of sparse representation in a library. Okay, so we're going to sparsely approximate this uh, new person in this library, and then we're going to see kind of where does the sparse, uh, kind of the non-zero support live. That's very likely where that person lives. Okay, so that's how you do SRC. Uh, and just some cool examples. Um, so here you have, um, 
kind of just an original face. This is a face with no noise added, no funny mustache, nothing. We coarse grain it, we run it through that optimization, and again, you see very, very clearly that there is activity in one region uh, of this library, and that region again corresponds to person seven. So the predicted image is very similar to the original image. And this original, this image did not have to be in that library. I think I actually removed this image from that library, or else that would be kind of cheating, or else it would just be a single delta function on that, uh, on that image. So this uh, is a real test image. This is not in the library, but there are other images of this person's face, and it finds the closest one. It actually finds the closest two and interpolates between them, okay? And then going back to our mustache example, you can take your mustache and downsample. Um, I think probably there, I was a little, I made a mistake on the error bar on, on my first plot over here. Um, this one should have had a little bit higher error. I think I just copied the wrong, the wrong image. But you get the idea. Um, even with a mustache with a pretty big outlier or occlusion here, uh, this information, this still has enough information in the eyes and the nose and the chin to accurately uh, reconstruct that person's face. Now again, the error, you can also get a predicted error between this image and the prediction, and you see that most of it lives in this mustache. Uh, you can also add a bunch of either salt and pepper noise or white noise. Uh, in this case, this is actually surprisingly hard for the algorithm, this kind of salt and pepper noise really messes things up, uh, and you get relatively large errors here. So that's that's a little surprising. Uh, you can also do it with like white noise. White noise is a little bit easier for this, uh, and you get relatively low low reconstruction errors. Okay, so uh, that's kind of the big idea behind. Um, sparse representation and then sparse representation for classification is that you can have a big library of training data and as long as your, uh, your measurement is kind of has less entries, less rows than columns in your library, you can do this sparse representation trick to find a few combinations uh, of your library that add up to your to your uh, your new test vector. And then if that ha if that library also has categories, you can use this for classification, like image classification. Okay, so that's pretty useful. Uh, I encourage you to try this out, it's really cool. Um, and you can actually use this in all kinds of applications in science and engineering, so I'll give you just kind of a teaser of how to do that. Um, I wanna point out this really interesting paper by uh, Bright, Lynn, and Kutz from 2013. So this is actually a very forward-looking paper. Uh, here they used sparse ideas from kind of compressed sensing and sparse representation for physical sciences, for engineering systems, pretty early. So this was before a lot of other people had kind of gotten on the sparsity uh, bandwagon and really started to use this. This is one of the earliest papers applying these sparse representation ideas for engineering systems. And in this example, what they were able to do, uh, they were taking these fluid flows past a cylinder example, so kind of canonical fluid flows, and based on very, very uh, small amounts of sensors, very few sensors on the surface of the cylinder, they were able to estimate what Reynolds number uh, the flow was at. So it's a really cool kind of classification problem. Was it a, a high Reynolds number, a medium Reynolds number, or a low Reynolds number? I think they had six categories of Reynolds numbers. Uh, and so that was a really, uh, really neat kind of problem. They could also reconstruct the flow field once they had found that part of the library. So once they found where uh, in Reynolds number their flow was, they could use those measurements to estimate uh, the flow field. So very, very cool uh, and very ahead of its time. And I'm gonna also point out that recently, uh, Jared Callahan, Kazuki Maida, and myself applied this to kind of a wider variety of flows to see what types of measurements you could get away with, what types of noise you could get away with, and really do uh, kind of an exhaustive study of how this scales up to more complex fluid flow problems. So this is very much like what we uh, described described in the, the SRC sparse representation uh, for, for classification algorithm, but here we're using sparse representation for flow field reconstruction, for full estimation of the full flow field. Okay, so we're not just trying to classify, is it flow A or flow B, we're trying to get all of the subtle details of this fluid flow. So that's a, that's a very hard problem.
So here we have in this example problem a large library of training data of that flow past a cylinder. Uh, we in, for every image in that training set, we measure at a fixed set of locations. I think here there's five locations. And so every column of our library are those five measurements at a particular instant in time, those five measurements at another instant in time, another instant, another instant, another instant, and so on. So that's how we build our library. That's an expensive offline training. You can do that on a supercomputer over the weekend, let it run. And now when you're doing this online, you're collecting measurements in the field, you're measuring at those same five locations on a really noisy field, and we're trying to do a sparse representation of that new noisy measurement in our library. And the same thing that worked for images works here for flow fields. You get this sparse uh, vector representing my new measurement in my library, and it does in fact actually correspond to the correct phase and so you can use that to reconstruct the full flow estimate and, and effectively denoise even from a very small number of very noisy measurements. I have five super noisy measurements. You can actually estimate the flow field. So this is great work by Jared Callahan. I encourage you to check out the paper uh, either in physical review fluids or on the archive. Um, he also showed that on this example, you could apply this to lots and lots of different measurement strategies, including kind of random points in the wake, or uh, a vertical slice of measurements, a horizontal slice of measurements, or a window. This would kind of represent like a PIV window in fluids. And he goes and shows like even with really, really corrupt measurements, like 80% corruption on the measurements, depending on the types of measurements you have, you can actually get very faithful reconstructed flow fields. Now that's not so surprising for this example because the flow past a cylinder is very low dimensional, very low rank. It's described by really only a few numbers in the right coordinate system. And so what Jared did was then scale this up to many uh, more complex flows. So this is sea surface temperature across the globe. Uh, this is the, the vorticity field in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and this is a mixing layer. So these are all pretty complicated, uh, or rather, you know, these three are definitely more complicated than the cylinder. And so you can go check out in the paper kind of what works, what carries over, what doesn't, uh, and when this method breaks for really, really complex flows. Kind of a teaser, something I think is really interesting, is that if you're using measurements kind of upstream in this flow, so let's say I measure some stuff here, it turns out that because this flow is chaotic, for the same upstream measurements, there might be many, many different things you can see downstream. And so there's this decorrelation length spatially in these physical problems, which means that sensors up here, the information content of how that affects flow structures down here kind of degrades as your measurement and estimation windows get farther and farther apart. So that's a really interesting kind of physical connection for, uh, for flow fields at least. But there's also, um, you know, you can do the same thing for images. You can figure out what regions of the face, if I included, have the most information and will give me kind of the most degradation uh, in my reconstruction. Okay, so I hope you uh, found that interesting. Sparse representation and sparse representation for classification are absolutely phenomenally powerful algorithms. You can use these for classical signal processing, image processing, but you can also apply these to modern engineering systems uh, and data systems. And this is very closely related to ideas in machine learning and kind of data science in general, where you're trying to take patterns in the data and leverage those patterns with optimization, in this case sparse optimization, to achieve a goal that seems like it is really kind of almost you know, impossible or magical, right? Like, you know, subtract the sunglasses off of a picture, x-ray vision, uh, classify an image from a very downsampled version of it. Okay, so really cool what you can do. Uh, I encourage you to try this all out for yourself. Thank you.